Hi, and welcome to the Modern Maker Workroom. As you can see, I'm not in my studio. My husband and I are on a trip to the Southwest while the studio is remodeled back home. But I still need to shoot an intro for this video for the hip roll, so here we are. This video isn't very long, but it's got some great instructions in it, and I will show you both how to sew it by hand and how to sew it by machine. And that way you can make your choice on your own. So grab some linen and some wool for stuffing, get your needles ready, and let's start stitching. Thanks so much. Here we go. I would go ahead and pause and take a screenshot of this image so that we can draft in our next step. We'll begin as we always do with a vertical line drawn with a ruler and a perpendicular line along the base. We are setting up the basic proportions of this wedge that we're going to create. So we'll take our waist tape and we're going to measure our length here, which we're going to measure at OI. So that's 1 8th plus 1 48th, and then we'll measure across the top at 1 12th. Now it'll be nice and tapered and small at the top, which will create um, a nice opening where the bum roll will sit on the body. Now we'll measure across the bottom, and we're going to measure 1 8th across the bottom. Now it's not a huge difference, but when you put 16 of these together, you'll notice that it is, um, it's pretty unique what this shape will do. So we're creating 90 degree angles at all of these points because they all have to stitch together into a nice smooth edge. And without 90 degree angles, we'll have all sorts of dips and valleys. So in order to create the 90 degree angle, we have to curve out at the bottom and in at the top. And this naturally creates a certain set of curves that when sewn together with 16 panels, the way we're going to do with this, you have um, a shape that is um, smooth and donut-like, as opposed to kind of a flat wedge shape where it, it tends to squish out into a disc. Now these two lines that I've just drawn are, are scaling lines. So the basic bum roll shape is an average size but if you want to go bigger you do these two lines along the side as we've shown and then you can add extra size to the roll you don't want to make it um, you only want to work from this end uh, the wide end you don't want to change the interior because that's the same whether you're going for a big roll or a small roll the the interior is where the body sits so the exterior edge is what you're changing which is the wide edge of this wedge so you can see here that I'm going pretty big and what I'll do next is I'll reshape my curves so that I have my 90 degree angles at the bottom and at the top and then I'm going to fold my paper in half and cut out the piece And what you'll see later on in the video is that after I made this little pattern, I did an adjustment. I felt like this was going to be too big for what I want to create for the women's outfit that we're working on. So I reduced it slightly, um, probably about half the distance you see here uh, is where I adjusted it down to. So once this pattern is cut out, then I will go to the fabric, prep the fabric, and we'll cut 16 wedges of this shape, and then we'll sew them all together. Here we are at the work table with our fabric laid out on the tabletop. Now I'm going to cut with four layers of fabric. Now this is a mid-weight linen, just kind of a, a chunk of something that's come out of my, my linen bin. But we have four layers of fabric, and then we're going to copy this shape down four times so that we have 16 pieces. One of the things I love about this particular style of roll 
is that unlike the type that's typically used in costuming today, which is basically cutting out a, a crescent shape um, with two layers and then stuffing it like a pillow, this shape lends itself more efficiently to the conservation mindset conservation of fabric mindset that comes from the time period and that it can easily be cut out of scraps of fabric it's all these pieces are very small so you see that I'm tracing them down here and I'm trying to nest them together so that I waste as little as possible okay All right, that's two tracings down, and then I'll do two more, and then we'll be ready to pin them together and cut. So after my double checking before I cut out, I found that some of the inner layers of this layer of uh, the stack of four fabrics were too short, and I was going to end up with pieces that were missing some chunks. So I'm tracing one more set of two to replace those two that aren't going to fit. And then I'm going to pin everything together and cut out. You can see the cutting is very basic. You just cut the layers out here. I'm removing the two that didn't fit. But you just cut them out, remove the pins, stack them up. Um, make your cuts nice and clean. Just because it's linen, if you have jagged cuts, it's easier for the fabric to begin to fray. And if you're stitching this entirely by hand, the less fraying you have, the better. Because it's so much more handling with handwork. You really want to make sure that your cutting is as, as neat as you can possibly make it. We're here over at my sewing station, ready to start assembling these pieces. So you can see I have 16 of them, so this is going to be a very repetitive process. And I'll show you the first few by hand, and then I'll move over to the sewing machine, and you can watch me sew them together there. I'm going to try to give more examples of how things can be done by both hand and machine, because I think in the realities of this world it'll be more useful for you. So we begin by putting two layers together. We'll start here at the edge. We'll take a couple of stitches to make sure that everything is secure and then we'll use a running stitch and a relatively small seam allowance and we'll put this together. Now the waist tape that I used to draft this pattern was 29 inches which is quite small so I'm using a quarter of an inch seam allowance. If I wanted to use a larger seam allowance I could also have added a little bit extra in the pattern phase so that I could be more comfortable using a larger allowance. Now, every few stitches you'll see me take an extra stitch to help secure the threads. That way if anything pops or breaks or, or catches, the seam will maybe start to open, but it won't open completely. So, the stitching that I'm doing is fast and secure. I'm taking about four stitches at once before drawing. And it's just a plain running stitch. I'm using a fairly heavy needle because I can since it's linen. And it's being sewn with a linen thread. It's probably about a size 60, I would think. Once this seam is sewn, we'll take it to the iron and we'll press it to one side. And then we'll pick stitch the seam allowance in place. And that just adds a little bit of extra security so that uh, when it has the pressures of being worn, the top stitching of the or the pick stitching of the allowance will help keep it sturdy. As with most seams that we stitch, we are going to reach the end and take a couple of stitches in one place to finish off and cut. Alright, and done. 
Now you can see the beginnings of the shape starting to form here. We have a round curved exterior and a curved interior, and you can see this curvature of the donut shape beginning to form. You can see that each wedge has an angled side, and as they continue to get sewn together, you'll see this donut shape take place. Now, we're just going to do this again. It's very basic. You know, thread the needle, tie a knot, give a running stitch, take some extra stitches for security, push to one side, pick stitch the seam allowance, and repeat. To show you a little bit more detail, we're at the sewing machine now doing a different method of assembling this. So what we do is we run them through the machine two at a time. So you can see that I've done this batch already and you just take two at a time, you run through and you just run the next one immediately following that and immediately following that. Once you have groups of two, you repeat this process and this is called chaining them together through the machine. So now we'll take two of them here. We will match up our edges and use the presser foot width, which is a quarter of an inch on my machine. And uh, sorry, the machine's powerful. It's going to shake the camera here. I'll try to go slow. But then we just run it right through the machine, take a good solid back stitch, and then we'll do the next two just like so so in no time you can put 16 of these pieces together and you'll be ready to move on so what I'll do once these are sewn together is I will run them through the machine a second time turning the allowances all to one side and top stitching them in place there's really no rule where that bum roll is concerned as to which direction you want to turn it. Um, but as a general rule, we have seam allowances that face away from center back and toward center front. You can um, do it any direction that you want, but uh, in this case, I would say just make them all consistent. All right. So in just a few minutes, we've gone from almost no assembly to having almost the entire thing put together. It's very fast. Initial assembly is complete, and we are now about to start our top stitching. So you can see the direction I have begun uh, with my hand top stitching, so I'm going to continue that direction with the machine. So I'm just turning the allowances the direction they need to go, and then I'm pulling the fabric tight as it goes under the presser foot. And I'm using the interior edge of one of the prongs of my presser foot as the guide for my top stitching. And since there are 16 pieces, we just keep repeating the same process over and over again until it's done. Now we're going to begin closing the interior edge. Now this is a little bit different from the way we assembled the panels because each of the panels isn't taking a whole lot of stress so it was okay to do those with a running stitch. But this interior edge is going to be stretched open and pulled closed and tight and weight is going to be pulling on it. So this should be back stitched rather than running stitched. I'm using a heavier linen thread. I'm using a pretty, pretty substantial cord, probably equivalent to about number 30 crochet cotton. Um, it's, it's thick and it's strong, and I'm going to use a back stitch to stitch this entire seam. So we're ready to go here. Again, I'm just using a quarter of an inch because it doesn't need to be a big allowance, but I am going to stitch with small, firm stitches with this heavy thread. And the entire thing is back stitched, so it'll take a little bit to do, but um, once it's done, I think the benefit will be worth it. One of the things that is good with a back stitch is that it is slightly elastic because of its 
backwards loop structure, it has some elasticity to it, which is great for a seam that's going to take some stretching and stress. We're almost done with this seam now. The back stitching has happened. We just have to get across this one final panel. And then we'll be able to fasten off. I just want you to look a little bit at the rhythm of the technique here. I'm putting the needle in, pushing it through with just a flick of the wrist, as opposed to stabbing back and forth. This is how a tailor executes a back stitch. With the seam complete, now we're going to turn this whole donut right side out. And you can see it there a little bit. So we just turn the tube. And it's a little bit awkward because it's round and it's linen and it sticks to itself. So I'm going to do this in a couple of stuffing passes here. So I'm running everything up onto my thumb and then I'll push that little end through so that I can grab it like so and then the whole thing will come. There we go. So the next step will be to stuff it filled with wool and then we'll close the ends and add the ties. So here's the wool. I'm going to show you two different kinds. This is kind of wool wadding. And so I'm going to take it and I'm going to pull it apart, tease it apart in my hand so that it's a little fluffier. And then I'm going to stuff this as far in as I can get it into the center. And then I will grab another wad of wool, approximately the same size, and do the same thing. It gets a little bit easier when I switch to using the roving. This wool wadding is probably a little closer to what would have been done in the time period, just because um, roving, the way we use roving, is not something that I understand as a, as a period treatment for wool before it goes into the spinning process. So here we'll stuff some more in. And then I'll jump ahead to using the roving and show you how that's done. Okay, here we are with our roving. I'm stuffing the first fluffy end in at this point, but then as I proceed, you'll see that I'll start wrapping it around my hand and using that as a gauge for the amount of stuffing that goes in. This will help keep the amount of stuffing regular so that it has the same density all the way around. Okay, now that I'm filled in right there, see I'm pushing and pushing the stuffing all the way around into the middle. Three, four, five. Wraps around my hand to get a nice water roving and then I'm just going to stuff that in. Next, one, two, three, four, and I'm going to stuff that in. And I'll do this consecutively in just little balls of roving that I wind up. The nice thing about the roving is it's dense, so it when you wind it into these little balls, you're not going to have as much collapse. I like using the wool because it's lighter weight than uh, cotton as a stuffing. I don't recommend using polyester as a stuffing only because it's right on top of the hips and at the small of the back and it can get very very warm to wear after a while. If polyfill is all you have access to, by all means, just know that the garment itself might be a little warm to wear after a while. So we'll repeat this process on the other side of this roll, but you can really see that it taking shape, and it's an elegant curved donut form that looks and feels like something that should be worn underneath these clothes. Based on the one or two surviving images that we have, this shape is uh, pretty plausible. So um, we'll move on to the finishing and uh, then we'll show you how to dress it on the mannequin.
Okay, here we are with this lovely donut shape ready to close the ends. And you'll watch me fuss with this a little bit. I'll tell you, there is no good way to hold this shape for convenient stitching. So I'm taking my heavy linen thread again, and now I'm going to just do a running stitch all the way around and gather up this end and push the raw edges to the inside and then stitch it closed. It's the easiest way. You can cut a little circle if you want to and just cap the end with a little circle, but um, I think that makes too hard of an edge. I like the way this works because it makes kind of a soft rounded edge on the roll, um, which sits nicely under clothing. I'm taking relatively large stitches and I'm giving about, I guess about a half inch seam allowance here from the raw edge so that I have something substantial to push inside as I draw this closed. It's somewhat like the process of making a cloth button where you run your thread around the outside and you pull it closed and then you stuff the seam allowance to the inside. So here we go. And we'll start closing now, I think. Just a couple more stitches. There we go. And as I pull this tighter and tighter, I'm just going to take that raw edge and stuff it inside. It's not, um, it's not elegant by any means. Okay. And the tighter you pull, the more you have to work to hide the edges. And then I'm going to take stitches across through the gathers, and it'll um, tighten everything up and keep it secure. Still going around the circle and then you'll see me just pull tight, take a few stitches in one direction and then in another direction and then it'll be done. There we go. Here we have some twill tape that I have dyed just with a little bit of tea to get it down to the right color. Something that isn't just stark white. I'm, I'm typically a stark white doesn't bother me but for some reason when I was making this particular garment I obsessed over it a little bit and uh, wanted something that was a little bit less bright so I just knotted off one end and left a nice 10 12 inch long tie and put a knot in the other side of it so I have two of them each with a knot in one end and then I'll sew the unknotted end onto the garment. So as you watch me work with this, there really, as I said before, there's no good way to hold this to do this work. So what I'll end up doing is putting the working end kind of between my legs to hold it, and then I've got the other end up underneath my chin. Here, let me I'm going to move the camera here in a second and show you because it's pretty funny. It's, it's I found it to be the only convenient way to do this. Um, I'm back stitching the tie in place and I'm trying to get nice and deep so that I am well around. Oops, see it's come unsecured from my chin. There we go. I want these stitches to be deep so that they are strong. See, here we go. You need to see this silliness. So this is how it needs to be held. All right, back to work. So once the back stitching is done in this direction, then I will fold the tape in on itself to cover the raw edge, and then I'll stitch across it a second time. And that makes sure that everything is no raw edges are exposed, so there's nothing to fray out, because twill tape really does fray quite a bit. So here I'll just work back stitches across the end of my tape with the seam allowance folded away inside. And these stitches are pretty big. This is just about securing 
the allowance away and less about securing it to the garment itself, which it does do that, but it's not the primary focus. All right? One down, one to go. I'm stitching all the way around it for extra security. These, these take a lot of pressure and abrasion, and I don't want them... Um, I don't want them coming unstitched. And done. You'll notice I've positioned that tie on closer to the interior edge of the roll so that when it's against the body, the pressure is on the inside edge, not the outside edge. And it, it will have less of a tendency to slip down during wear. Okay, here I am at the mannequin wearing her petticoat and her pair of bodies. Now this shouldn't go at the waist. That's too high. You need this to go on the high hip below the waist so that where the waistband is tight around the waist of the wearer, then the skirt falls in a nice angle from the waist over the roll and then down to the floor. Now you see that I've got this tied. I'm tilting it up and back and then I'm shoving the ties underneath the pair of bodies. To me it looks like I haven't tied this roll quite tight enough. I might pull it a little bit more closed, but once it's in position, it shouldn't really go anywhere. The stays will hold it in place. And there you go. There's our hip roll, ready to be worn and ready for skirts to go on top. Thank you so much, and happy stitching.